So after the daguerreotype was invented, photography technology improved or got better very, very quickly. And for the purposes of our class, you don't need to know all of the different steps in between um, the daguerreotype and the kind of modern photograph. Just know that it happened and it happened really fast. Photographers themselves realize that they have a certain amount of power. Um, that the public looks at a photograph and thinks, well, this is totally accurate. This is totally true. There's no way to make this up. The photograph is an accurate recording of what is in front of the camera. And photographers realize that that gives them a power to convey things that are happening in this country and elsewhere that are bad. And that if they show bad conditions for people um, to other people, that those people will be upset. So it, photography becomes a means for social change, for social justice, that if we take pictures of bad situations and show them in the news, people will be upset. And that's exactly where we are right now. An early photographer that did this was Jacob Rees. Um, Jacob Rees was an immigrant to this country in the late 1880s. And um, he lived in the, basically he lived in the tenements in New York in complete and total squalor and um, ended up getting a job as a, as a journalist and realized that if he took pictures of the squalor the immigrants to this country were living in and showed those in a newspaper, he thought, well, people will be upset. People will be upset and they will demand change for immigrants to this country um, and their living conditions. And that's exactly what he did. So these are the kind of photographs that he took. Um, this image is called Five Cents a Spot. It's probably the most famous image taken by Jacob Rees. And it depicts a very typical immigrant tenement in New York City, um, and it was very powerful to the middle class, upper middle class, middle class New Yorkers that saw this image. They saw a horrible situation. I mean, count how many people we have in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. So we have six or seven people living in this tiny space. Think about what other problems, um, what other health hazards and safety hazards are in this um, are in this space. For example, this looks like mold growing on the ceiling and on the walls. This bed doesn't look like it's going to be able to continue to be sturdy. We've got all of these flammable objects right near the stove. And I'm sure that there's no fire escape or safe way for these people to get out. And if there is one, it's prob it probably couldn't withstand the number of people that are living in this room. I mean, it would, it would just become a log jam. So uh, Jacob Rees took these photos, he printed them up in the newspaper, and he also um, wrote a book and had the photos printed up and put in a book. And then he went on a speaking tour. And uh, New Yorkers were so upset about the conditions of immigrants that there were changes made. Again, it wasn't just Jacob Rees, and it wasn't fast necessarily, but Jacob Rees was a major uh, force in the, the change in housing regulations, safety regulations for, um, for New Yorkers. Here's some more pictures by Jacob Rees. Um, you can see how a photo like this would impact um, a person, you know, opening the newspaper that day. This man's facial expression is one of uh, hopelessness is what I see. Um, you know, he's got his mattress folded up on into thirds on top of two barrels. Is it because of rats? Is it because of cockroaches that he's lifted himself up like that? That's my guess. Now, one thing to think about is in the last lesson, we looked at this print, which was also put in the newspaper to um, convey a horrible example of police brutality. And there are some differences between the print and the photograph over on the left. The photograph on the left is taken with a camera. We know that this man was actually there. We know that his mattress was folded in thirds. We know he had this actual facial expression. The image on the right by Damier, the print, um, this is this was never this was never actually the, the event happened. The killing of all of the people in the apartment building happened. 
Did this scene actually happen? Probably not. Um, Damier read about the event, heard about the event, but this is an interpretation of what happened. It is from his imagination. Yes, there were many generations of people killed in that apartment complex or that apartment building, but this exact scene was not taken with a camera. It, it is an interpretation of what happened. So think for a second, how are photographs different from prints or paintings in terms of how we respond to them? Why would we respond differently? Or how would we respond differently to a photograph of a horrible situation versus a print of a horrible situation? And maybe think about the photographs that you've seen of the coronavirus crisis all over the world. That's what you're gonna be doing um, next week for your discussion board is thinking about uh, the power of photographs to tell us what is going on in the world. Um, photography continued to be used for social justice and for social change. Photographers continued to recognize that they had a tremendous amount of power to show people that were not in an event or were not directly seeing brutality, what was going on in the world. Um, photography was used heavily during the United States Civil Rights Movement. This is a very famous photograph um, taken just before the march from Selma to Montgomery. Um, this march was undertaken by many African Americans who lived in Alabama and they were advocating for voting rights and they decided to walk from Selma, their town, to Montgomery, the capital of Alabama, um, to, to advocate for their voting rights. Um, this photograph was taken by the photographer Spider Martin. Spider Martin is here. Um, Spider Martin was a very famous civil rights photographer. He was a friend of um, Dr. Martin Luther King, John Lewis, um, many other key civil rights leaders. And his job, or the job that he gave himself, was to go to, to peaceful civil rights protests and take photos and then send those photos around to the news um, so that, so that uh, sympathetic people in the North and other places in the country would see those photos and understand what was going on in the South and um, in, in a way that they couldn't have if they hadn't seen the photographs. So let's take a look at this photograph. Um, so these are the civil rights marchers and these are the police and we've got this very stark contrast uh, between these two groups of people the civil rights uh, marchers on the left are standing two by two they're wearing what looks to be nice clothes office clothes coats and nice pants and walking shoes I mean they're about to walk 50 miles so they're walking they're wearing um, comfortable shoes um, but they are dressed very well and they are standing with their hands in their pockets, uh, comfortable positions, and there is absolutely no threat. They do not show any kind of aggression or violence. They're just standing there very, very peacefully, and their body language suggests that they are not a threat. Now, over here, take a look at how the police look different. They are aggressively marching forward. They've got a much different clothes on than the protesters there. It looks like they're wearing riot gear. They've got on gas masks. They've got tear gas. They've got guns. The protesters are not armed. They've got batons. It is such a different um, sense of body language, such different gestures, a very, uh, such a strong contrast between these two groups of people um, captured by by Spider Martin. Now, the background of this story is that the um, protesters had had were about to start their march, and they received a two-minute warning to disperse. They received a two-minute warning from the police to disperse. Now, obviously, um, it is one of the United States' Bill of Rights to be able to meet peacefully. So it was within, very much within their rights to be able to do this protest and do this march. But they were told um, by the police to disperse. Um, they were given two minutes to disperse. And this photograph was actually taken before the two minutes was over. And we have proof of that, which means that the police did not listen or that they, they did not follow their own guidelines. Um, there was a terrible amount of violence after 
um, I mean, before the two minutes were over, but after this, after this approach by the police. And um, it took the, the marchers from Selma many tries to finally be able to make it to Montgomery. The effect that this photo had is really important because Spider Martin was able to take lots of photos of this event and send them to the newspapers and send them to the news and get coverage um, of the, the peaceful civil rights protests and the violence that these peaceful protests were met with in the South. There are some things that, if you're interested, um, the movie Selma, which came out a couple of years ago, we were going to watch a clip of it in class. We can't, but um, check it out. You'll see that the scene, this scene um, actually takes place in the movie, and it is based on Spider Martin's series of photographs. Um, the artist Hank Willis Thomas, you might look up, um, he's a contemporary sculptor and conceptual artist. He also does photography. We were going to see some of his works at the Nasher um, on our field trip, and he did a series of photographs um, based on Spider Martin's photographs. So you might, uh, if you're interested, you might check him out too. I recommend it. Hank Wells Thomas's work is very powerful, and the Selma video is really interesting because you'll be able to see how um, they used uh, Spider Martin's photographs to shoot the movie. So on a much lighter note, photography has other effects um, besides social change and social justice. Photography also begins to affect how painters work. I want you to imagine going out um, into the street scene and taking a photograph that's bad, taking a photograph where you accidentally like chop off somebody's arm or you cut somebody in half or you chop somebody's hand off or things are off center. We have all taken very, very quick snapshots, very, very quick uncomposed pictures. That's possible with photography. It's possible with a camera. It's possible to just take a snapshot. Well, painters look at those snapshots and they think, huh, that's really cool. Maybe our paintings should take on the quality of snapshots. And they, so they start to do that. Painters start copying a snapshot. They start looking at snapshots taken by photographers and not making their own snapshots, but making their paintings look like snapshots. So I brought in this. This is uh, two scenes of Paris in the rain. One is a photograph and one is a photograph over here and one is a painting. And you'll see that this is an odd painting. This guy has been chopped off at the knees. So is she. Um, this guy, he's, his head is popping out from an umbrella. People are off center. These guys are not centered. There's this big hole in the middle. This guy is chopped in half. Um, and, and then this lamppost is chopped off. It's just a very unusual and odd composition. It looks more like a snapshot that somebody would take than, um, than a painting. Oh, also, the people are looking off to the side. They're not looking at us. Again, it looks more like a snapshot. And this artist had been looking at snapshots. He was interested in the idea of a photographic snapshot and copied it in his painting. Um, this is a uh, Edgar Degas did the same thing. I mean, look at these paintings. They're so strange. Um, Jock is at the start with a flagpole. We've got this flagpole right in the middle of the painting, and it's right in front of this horse. The horse has been chopped off at the butt, and in the middle, direct middle of the painting, we've got a horse's butt. You know, it's my favorite thing in paintings is horse's butts. Um, in the bottom center, we've got this gigantic nothingness. And then the top, we've got nothingness. Again, it looks like a bad photograph. It looks like a photograph that you would throw out. Same thing here. This is the strangest family portrait that I have ever seen. This girl is getting impaled on an umbrella. She's looking this way. She's looking this way. The, the father is looking this way. This guy's gotten chopped in half. All these kids, the kids are chopped off at the waist. There's nothing in the middle. Again, it looks like a bad picture. It looks like a snapshot. And that is what the top, what painters were doing. They were looking at snapshots. I know you guys have seen this before. This is Guernica, but I want you to think about it again in the context of photography. It's very abstract, right? You have to look at it for a while to figure out what's going on. And 
and even after you look at it for a while, it's so chaotic, it's a little unclear where everything is. Definitely, Pablo Picasso did this abstractly to make it less gory and to get us to focus on it more and to get us and to communicate the chaos of a bombing. I wonder if he also did it in an abstract way because of photography. Photography made it possible to take an accurate photograph, an accurate image in a second. A painter could spend years and still not make it as accurate as a photograph. But a photograph can't be abstract. Um, so it is very possible that Pablo Picasso made this abstract and other abstract painters began using abstraction because it was something that photography couldn't do. They had been working so hard, painters had been working so hard to make things realistic. But now they had photography to do that for them. So it freed them up a little bit to use their imagination, to tell stories in a different way, to express themselves differently, and to do something that photography couldn't. So that is probably a very, very big influence on abstraction is photography and painters being free to tell stories in a different way and um, do making sure they could do something that photography couldn't do. Another photographer that um, used photography to make change, I would not say social change, I would say environmental change, is Ansel Adams. You'll watch a couple videos about him. Uh, he's a very, very famous photographer that used his photographs of the American West to advocate for um, the national parks and the preservation of land in the West. The interesting thing about Ansel Adams is that his photographs were highly manipulated, that he would take his photograph out in nature and then he would go into the dark room and he would change them a lot, especially light and dark. He would really emphasize the light and dark areas. He would change the, the gradation from light and dark. Um, so his photographs um, the resulting photograph look a lot different from the negative, and um, it shows the ways that photos can be tricky. We look at the scene of Yosemite National Park, and we think, well, it looked just like that. Well, it didn't. Um, Ansel Adams manipulated this photograph heavily to make it look like how he felt about the scene, to give the drama of the scene. Maybe you've taken a landscape photograph, and when you look at the photograph, you think, oh, that sucks. Well, Ansel Adams did the same thing. He made sure that his photographs, the resulting photograph, looked like how he, how he felt about the scene, looked like how he saw the immense power, drama, grandeur of the scene. And he had a lot of different tricks in the darkroom um, to do that. And you'll watch a couple videos about how Ansel Adams did that. Oh, here's another one. Uh, Grand Tetons in uh, in Wyoming. Again, the actual scene probably doesn't look like this. Ansel Adams made lots of shifts in light and dark areas to give it that sense of drama and grand. Uh, same thing here. You look at the scene and this this kind of darkness up here and lightness, you like you don't actually see something like that. This is um, something that Ansel Adams was able to do by manipulating his negatives. Lastly, um, this is the last video that you'll watch today. It's about the uh, Vietnamese and Cambodian artist Bin Don, who does something really interesting, which is he really returns photography to its roots. And um, its roots being photography is a, is a light picture, a recording of light. And he figured out a way to make a photograph or to print a photograph onto a living leaf. And here are a couple that he did. Um, you will watch a video about the entire process, but I think it's very interesting in this time of extreme technology in photography um, to really take photography back to its roots and just capture light on a living leaf. Um, okay, that's it. I uh, hope you guys have a good weekend and I will see you next week.